Find journalism jobs, internships, scholarships, and more at www.cubreporters.org. Hi, I'm Professor Mark Grabowski, and today we're going to be discussing how to write a good lead for your stories in journalism. Once a reporter has finished interviewing and gathering information, it's time to think about how to begin the story. And this opening part, or the lead as we like to call it in journalism, is the most important part of your story. You know, you hear so much about how it's important to make a good first impression in life. Well, journalism is no exception. If you want readers to read your entire story, you've got to grab their attention right from the start by having a good lead. Write a bad or a boring lead, and most readers will lose interest and jump ship. And good leads are even more important in today's, you know, age of online journalism and and new media because it's so easy for readers to move on to another story or to another website. Okay, so first things first. What do we mean when we say the lead? you know it's the opening part of the story but how how much are we talking here are we talking a sentence or or several paragraphs or or what well typically the lead is the first sentence or perhaps the first couple sentences sometimes it's as short as just one word and sometimes it can be as long as uh, a few paragraphs but generally you want to try to get to your point as quickly as possible uh, because in most cases the lead is all that readers read, so you don't want to be wasting their time. Sounds easy, right? Well, writing a good lead is easier said than done. Initially, most young journalists are not good at writing leads. The reason for this is that they typically don't take their first journalism class until college, or perhaps graduate school even. Prior to that, all of their writing has been for their English composition classes. Now, I do believe that before you can become a good journalist, you need to have a strong grasp of language and grammar, the types of things you're taught in your English composition classes. But writing for the media is vastly different than writing for your high school English class or your college English class. And nowhere is this more apparent than in the lead. For example, Most English teachers will tell you to begin your first paragraph in your English papers with a topic sentence, that is, a sentence of what your paper will be about. But that would be an awful way to begin a journalism article. But it's hard to break 12 years of writing habits. We're going to try to do that in today's lesson, though. Today's lesson, we'll take a look at some of the different types of leads uh, that are commonly used Uh, We'll talk about some creative approaches you can take uh, to writing your story, and we'll also talk about some leads uh, you want to avoid, including the uh, topic sentence lead, which is so popular in English composition papers. Now, there are many different types of leads. Sometimes the proper lead for a story is obvious, but other times there are several satisfactory ways to begin a story, and the writer's task is more difficult. So we'll begin by looking at the standard types of leads, or hard leads, as they're sometimes called. And then we'll talk about uh, more creative approaches, leads with flares, or or soft leads, as they're commonly called. We'll begin with the summary lead. This is the most traditional lead in journalism. Here are the characteristics of a summary lead. It is to the point and factual. It is meant to give the reader a quick summary of the story in as few words as possible usually in one sentence and that one sentence should be 30 words or less by the time you know you're getting to the 25th or so word in your sentence you're starting to approach a run-on sentence a sentence that just keeps running on and on and what happens is the reader gets lost so you don't want to go much over 25 and certainly not over 30 words in your summer lead sentence The summer lead contains the essence of the story, that is, the most important part of the story, but not necessarily all of the five W's in H, the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, 
and the how. And that's because, like I said, you only want to spend at max 25 or 30 words on the summary lead, so you can't cover all the five W's and H. A trick for deciding uh, what the essence of your story is and what your summary lead should be is to imagine you're calling up your friend uh, to tell him or her about your story, uh, and imagine that your cell phone battery is dying, so you've only got maybe 10 seconds before your cell phone dies. How would you describe that story? Uh, what happened? in those 10 seconds to your friend. Say it out loud and then write it down. That's your summary lead. As such, summary leads often focus on the who and the what of the story and then follow closely with the when and the where. The how and the why may be explained or suggested further into the story. For example, take this uh, sample summary lead sentence. The purchase of new computers will strain next year's budget Stansbury University President Jeff Jefferson announced at last week's faculty meeting. Notice a few things about this lead. First, it's under 25 words. If you count it up, you'll find that it's 21 words. Second, it focuses on the most important of the five W's, the who, President Jeff Jefferson, and the what, the purchase of the new computers will strain the budget. And then the summary lead follows closely with the when and the where last week's faculty meeting. Here's a few more tips to aid you in writing a good summary lead. Uh, first, you want to summarize the most newsworthy fact within the first 10 words. So notice in our example, the purchase of new computers will strain next year's budget, Stansbury University President Jeff Jefferson announced. We have the most important, the most newsworthy fact in those first 10 words, and that is the purchase of new computers will strain next year's budget. The most newsworthy thing is not that there was a faculty meeting last week. The fact that there was a faculty meeting is not news, okay? Big deal. There was a faculty meeting. So what? They happen regularly and most of the time people could care less, including the professors who attend them. But people do take an interest when something significant happens at one of those meetings. When the president of the university says that there may be budget problems, that's news, okay? That could mean that there could be cuts in department budgets, uh, there could be uh, you know, a hiring freeze on new professors. It could affect students also because it could mean they might have to raise tuition. So that is news and people care about that. Let's go over this again because it's really important. It's not enough to say that there was a faculty meeting or that a faculty meeting was held last week. That's what's known as a topic lead. It may be acceptable for your English classes, but it's not okay for a journalism article. The news, which is what we're interested in reporting as journalists, the news is not that a meeting was held. What matters is what happened at that meeting. Topic leads are weak because they convey no actual news to readers. Instead, they say to readers, maybe something happened, or maybe not. Read on and find out chances are readers won't read on. Okay, next tip uh, when it comes to writing summary leads. You want to cite the source of any opinion or controversial fact uh, if you use it in your summary lead. So in the example I showed you, the purchase of new computers will strain next year's budget. The president of the university said that. So you want to cite his name. It may very well be a fact that these new computers, you know, they're going to cost a lot of money. They're going to strain next year's budget. Seems like common sense, right? Well, you know, might upset some people. Some people might think that, oh, he's just saying that. He's pretending the school's facing these difficult economic times because he's got negotiations coming up for a new faculty contract. Uh, so at any rate, whenever you have a controversial fact uh, or an opinion like that, you want to state in your lead who's the source of it. And then my final tip on writing a summary lead is to consider using a delayed identification lead. This is also sometimes referred to as a blind lead. Let me explain. Sometimes with summary leads you don't always want to clearly identify the subject or the who right away. Uh, in the above example the who, the, the president of the university, was identified because he was an essential element of the story. When the university president speaks about the budget, 
people listen. They take him seriously because he has a lot of say about how money at the school is spent, if, if not the ultimate say on what the school's budget is going to be. So when he says something about the budget or about a matter pertaining to the university, you know, he's a significant guy, has a lot of power, you want to cite him in your lead. Often, however, the subject or the who doesn't have much name recognition, nor do readers care all that much about the subject's name. So when this occurs, you want to use a descriptive pronoun to identify the person in the lead. Provide his or her specific name and title in a later paragraph. For example, take this summary lead that has a delayed identification. For saving the life of the victim of a hit-and-run accident, two Stansbury University juniors were honored for bravery. In a ceremony held last week, Dave Davidson and Cindy Carson received a plaque naming them heroes. Davidson and Carson pulled journalism professor Mary Johnson from a car just before it exploded. Well, who is Dave Davidson and Cindy Carson? Chances are, if you go to Stansbury University, you probably don't know. So their names aren't really essential to the lead. You know, they're, they're just these kind of random people who went and did this heroic act. And, you know, you're going to give them their due credit in time, but not in the lead. Because, uh, you know, the story here, the news, is that these two students saved this professor's life. When people go and recount the story, that's where they're going to say, hey, did you hear about these two students who pulled this professor from this exploding, uh, this vehicle before it exploded? They're not going to go, however, and say, hey, did you hear what Dave Davidson did? I mean, unless, of course, they're friends with him. Otherwise, the person they're telling it to is going to be like, Dave Davidson? Well, who's he? So in cases like this, where the name is obscure, most people don't know, or use a delayed identification. Most of the time you're going to want to use this delayed identification approach for your summary lead because most of the time you're going to be writing about everyday ordinary people who happen to get into the news because they did something extraordinary. In other words, they're limited purpose public figures. They're not normal public figures. You know, if you're, you're, you're a White House correspondent and you're, you're covering the president or a state house correspondent and covering the governor or a sports writer and you know you're you're covering the NBA or something uh, guys like LeBron James for example you know then it makes sense uh, to identify the person in the lead because they're famous everyone knows who they are people are interested in these people uh, just because of who they are not only because of what they do but anything they do people care about uh, that's not the case with you know regular people what's news, what makes them newsworthy is the things they do. So focus on the what, identify the who later. Use that delayed identification lead. So that's how you write a summary lead. Now let's move on to uh, more creative leads or what I like to call leads with flair. Some people also refer to them as soft leads. Unless you're writing a hard news uh, story for a daily newspaper or a regularly updated website, the summary lead just doesn't reel readers in you need to take a more creative approach. For example, you probably know the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Well, imagine if you, you tried to, to write a, a summary lead about that fairy tale. It might go something like, after scaring away an intruder named Goldilocks, who had broken into their house, eaten all their food, broken a baby chair, and then fallen asleep, three bears lived happily ever after once upon a time. So how's that sound? Not so good, right? Okay, so let's talk about some different approaches you can take for writing a creative lead or lead with flair, and we'll begin with an example. Not even freezing temperatures could stop progress. With a thud, bulldozers churn the icy earth, beginning work on the university's new technology center. Quote, the Hancock Technology Center will offer students state-of-the-art facilities and relieve overcrowding of current computer labs. Stansbury University President Jeff Jefferson said at a groundbreaking ceremony Monday. Here's an example of a story that could have been giving a standard summary lead, but this one has more flair, and, uh, you know, chances are people, they saw this groundbreaking going on, they know what's going on, so if you just went with the summary news lead, people probably wouldn't have cared less. You know, it's old news, they know this is going on. If you take a more creative approach, you might be able to reel some readers in, and get them to read a story they otherwise wouldn't. Now when you take this alternative approach, this creative 
lead approach to begin your story, you have to remember to include uh, what's known as a nut graph. Let me explain. When you use a creative lead, it may not contain the most important facts or tell exactly what the story is about right up front. Remember, you're kind of trying to, to tease the reader into your story. That info, the, 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 all the, the five W's and the H, may be delayed until a later paragraph, which is known as the nut graph. The nut graph is the paragraph that contains the basic core or nutshell, the essence of the story. Don't take too long getting to the nut graph. Hit it by the third paragraph at the latest, otherwise readers are like, well, what is this story about? What's, where is it going? And they'll stop reading. So for example, take this story about pipe smoking. Notice it doesn't begin with a summary lead. You don't know right away that it's about pipe smoking. It teases you in, but by the second paragraph, the second graph, it gets to its point. So here we go. Sherlock Holmes did it. So did Albert Einstein. Hugh Hefner, Bing Crosby, General Douglas MacArthur, President Gerald Ford, and Popeye the Sailor. Yes, they all discovered the secret of looking smooth, suave, and utterly sophisticated pipe smoking. Incidentally, that is what's known as a list lead. Sometimes, instead of focusing on just one person, place, or thing in the lead, you want to impress the reader with a long list of persons, places, or things. Uh, and that's just uh, one of the many different types of approaches you can take to writing a creative lead. Let's talk about a few others now. The scenic lead. This lead typically begins with a description of the scene surrounding an event. This lead is typically used for stories in which the setting is prominent, such as stories about festive events, performances, sports, graduation, and things like that. It can also be used to strike a mood appropriate for the story. For example, a student in my class last year used a scenic lead approach for a profile story she wrote, uh, which was later published in the Asbury Park Press. And that approach worked well for her story, so let's take a look. The lights shine down, and the music surrounds her as she spins across the stage into the arms of her partner. The audience roars its approval as the music slows down and the curtains begin to rise. In the end, it's just another workday for teenager Chelsea Rittenhouse. At 18, the Howe resident is the youngest member of the New York Theatre Ballet, which describes itself as the most widely seen chamber ballet company in the United States. The professional group also tours abroad. So the story is about an 18-year-old who is the youngest member of a prestigious New York City uh, ballet group, but instead of beginning with a standard lead, which, you know, would be very boring for this situation, uh, she opts to start with a scene setting lead uh, to sort of give you a glimpse into uh, you know what a work day is like for her and of course a typical work day for her is a lot different than a typical work day for any other 18 year old um, and that's why she's writing this story because she's not you know your average 18 year old uh, doing your average 18 year old thing so in this case the scenic lead the scene setting lead works very well Next, we have the storytelling lead. And the way this works is using a narrative style. You begin by introducing the main characters, the conflict, and perhaps the setting of the story. The key with this is you really want to make the readers feel the drama and want to know what's going to happen next. You know, they just they, they can't wait to get to the next line and it's like reading a good book. You know, they want to turn to the next page and see what's going to happen next. That's how this lead works. And uh, this is also a good lead to uh, use that delayed identification technique we talked about that not only applies to standard leads, the summary leads, but also to creative leads. Uh, so with this lead, uh, identification can be postponed until a later paragraph in order to avoid disrupting the flow of the lead. So you don't have to necessarily give specific names. You can introduce, give the characters names in your story or the people uh, in a later paragraph, not in the lead. And here's an example of a storytelling lead. The man reached out a dirty hand, palm up. All I've got is a few bucks, Matt Spillane said, reaching into his pocket. The next thing Spillane knew, he was on the ground with a boot on his chest. Spillane, a Stansbury University junior, was being mugged. So that's an example of the storytelling lead. Now let's talk about what's known as the startling statement lead. 
And the way it works is you open with an amazing fact or a startling statement that arouses reader interest. So for example, Stansbury University students spend an average of seven hours per day surfing the internet. Whoa, seven hours per day! I mean, what the heck? That's a lot of time, right? It's the type of thing that when people say it's going to startle them, they're going to be like shocked, like, oh my gosh, can you believe this? You know, they might go and tell their friends about it. So when you have something like that, uh, perhaps like you're reporting on survey findings, you might take the most sort of startling finding in a survey and begin with that uh, as a way to lead into your story about, you know, the rest of the survey and other stuff they found. And this lead is sometimes also known as the amazing fact lead, but uh, keep in mind uh, the important thing with these leads isn't to memorize the names of them, but how they operate and to be able to apply them when you're writing a lead. Okay, moving along, next we have the opposite lead, and this is fairly straightforward. Uh, as the name of the lead indicates, basically what you do is you cite one point of view or observation, and then you follow with the opposite point of view. So for example, if you look at our screen, and this lead, Facebook rots the brain, according to new research by Stanford University psychology professor Tina Wang. Cameron Jackson, an honor student at the university, says that just isn't true. So in this lead, we've got these two opposite point of views expressed, and that's an opposite lead. And finally, let's discuss my favorite type of lead, the wordplay lead. This lead involves a clever turn of phrase, name, or word, but you gotta be careful when you use this lead uh, because it can seem gimmicky and it might mislead the reader. The reader might think that the story is about one thing and then discover it's about something else and get annoyed. Uh, but in this ne next example I'm going to show you, uh, uh, which, which actually I wrote when I was a reporter at the Providence Journal, uh, to begin a story about a um, fire that consumed a Halloween costume store, uh, I think the wordplay lead works pretty well for this story. So let's take a look. Bill Clinton will finally get taken to the cleaners. So will Dracula and a Playboy bunny. The three are among some 6,000 smoke-damaged costumes that will visit dry cleaners in the next few days because of a fire that broke out Wednesday night at Morris Novelty, a popular costume and novelty store. With Halloween only weeks away, the fire couldn't have come at a scarier time for the shop at 523 Main Street, which claims to be the largest of its kind in Rhode Island. Okay, so that is the wordplay lead, which is uh, basically a witty play on words. Okay, so now we've talked about uh, several different types of good lead approaches, and, you know, these are just a handful of the many different types of ways, good ways, that you can begin a story. Uh, now let's talk about some bad leads or some bad approaches that uh, you shouldn't do but that I often see young journalists uh, use in their stories. So here are some don'ts. Don't ever begin your story with a quotation. Okay, seldom is a quote so interesting that it's the best way to begin a story. Moreover, because it's difficult to understand the context of the quote, because you're, you're leading with it, you got no context, uh, it's rarely uh, the best way to summarize a story. I see a lot of articles in school newspapers begin with quotations, don't do it, it's lazy, editors hate it, uh, readers get confused by it. Uh, next, you want to avoid uh, leads that begin with questions. All right, uh, it's just stalling, all right, because the point of your article is to provide information. So don't begin by asking a question. Begin by providing information, by answering uh, the question. Similarly, you want to avoid uh, beginning your article with statements like, picture this or imagine this. Chances are they can't, okay? The reader wasn't there, but you were. It's your job to report on what you saw. You want to use your words uh, to sort of paint a portrait so that the reader can imagine it or picture it, but you don't want to come out and say, picture this or imagine this. Okay? That's kind of implied. That's why you're they're reading your article so they can get uh, an idea of, of what transpired, of what happened, of, of what it looked like. Now this next one we've already talked about, but I really can't emphasize it enough, so I'm going to bring it up one more time. Uh, that's topical leads 
you really want to avoid these at all costs. Uh, for example, you might see a lead something like uh, students posting on the website juicycampus.com is a controversial issue. Or you might see something else, something else that, you know, the lead says this is a controversial issue. Well, that's not a good lead, all right? Instead, what you want to do is explain in your lead why it's controversial. An alternative approach might be to have like a list lead. You could list some of the different uh, nasty or controversial things said on Juicy Campus and then have your nut graph. Or you could try an opposite lead where you have one student saying JuicyCampus.com is disgusting and should be banned and another student saying, oh, you know, JuicyCampus.com should not be banned. That's censorship and uh, students should be allowed to say whatever they want. Uh, similarly, if you have a lead like Harvard professor Cornell West spoke about race relations at Stansbury University last week. That's a topical lead. Okay, the fact that he spoke at the university, uh, that is not really in and of itself news. Uh, what he said, however, uh, could be newsworthy, might be newsworthy. Did he say something uh, that he's never said before? Does he have some sort of new, um, you know, philosophy on race relations? Or did he say something that was maybe controversial or that the audience sort of had mixed reactions to something like that would be newsworthy and uh, that is what you would want to begin your story with not a topical lead like this professor spoke at this university last week professors speak at universities all the time all right so I'm gonna list um, some more examples of topical leads here and you can just read over them these are leads that uh, the leads listed on the screen that actually appeared in college newspapers in the past year but uh, I went through and, and changed uh, the names in order to protect the identities of uh, these poor lead writers. Uh, but I just wanted to give you some examples to help you, uh, you know, better develop your sort of uh, bad lead radar so that you can avoid making uh, the same mistakes these writers did. And you'll know if, you know, you find yourself writing a lead like this, you'll be like, oh, wait a second. You know, red flag will go up. This 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 kind of sounds like a topical lead. I, I need to rewrite it and take a more interesting approach. Okay, here's my next piece of advice. Also avoid stating the obvious in your lead. For example, winner is here again, or this election is expected to be one of the most significant in history. I actually saw this in a column in a college newspaper uh, just the other day. You know, they say this about all elections. It's an obvious statement. Uh, also want to avoid wordiness. Be concise. Eliminate unnecessarily wordy phrases. For example, you don't need to say will be going when will go or goes will work just fine. And never use a dictionary definition. Uh, sometimes I'll see stories will begin by saying, you know, Webster's defines this as uh, don't begin a story that way. It's a lazy way out. Okay, we're almost done. Just a, a few more tips. Uh, another type of lead you want to avoid, okay, so another bad lead is what's known as the when lead. You want to avoid when leads, you know, when something happened, unless the time something occurred is by far the most important fact. Too many stories start with a dull counting of times such as this year or on November 7th or last week. For example, I often see in college newspapers a lot of leads that go something like this. On Friday, April 15th, three students won a regional debate competition. All right, That's what's known as a when lead because you're beginning with the date. Not a good way to begin the story because it's really not that interesting of a fact. That's something you want to include later on, not in the lead. Uh, an alternative to that or a better way to word that lead might be something like three Stansbury juniors took home $500 in top honors Friday in a regional debate contest. So you'll notice in the example of the good lead there that it begins with the who and the what which is a lot more interesting and important than the when. Alright, something else you really want to keep in mind when you're writing your stories is that your lead sets the tone or the mood for what's to follow. Uh, you know, depending on how you write your lead, you can make uh, your reader smile or laugh, cry or be upset, reconsider something. So you really want to keep that in mind uh, because if you pick the right, the wrong kind of tone for your story, it can be lethal. Media critics. Uh, often find bias uh, 
in journalism articles in two areas. The first is headlines, which reporters typically don't write. They're usually written by copy editors or editors. And the second uh, big offender is leads, and that is the word choice in the lead. So you really want to be careful and write neutral leads. For example, let's say you have to write a story about um, city officials decision to install new parking meters on uh, streets in the city. Now a journalist could lead her story, could begin her story by discussing how community members uh, sort of voice their outrage to this, calling it quote-unquote slimy and quote-unquote greedy. On the other hand, a journalist could lead her story with to avoid a budget deficit without raising taxes, city officials will install parking meters. But is either of those leads really objective or fair? The first lead seems negative and the second one seems kind of pro-government. So you always want to take a moment and reflect on your lead and ask yourself, you know, is this lead fair or am I slanting it uh, in favor or against one side? And of course, another question you want to stop and ask yourself is, well, is this lead interesting? I mean, if someone else were to read this lead, uh, not knowing the rest of the story, would they find it interesting enough that they'd want to continue reading on? If the answer is no, then you need to go and rewrite it. Which brings me to my last piece of advice, which is don't settle for the first lead you can come up with. Try several before choosing the best lead. Unless, of course, you've got a fast approaching deadline. You know, if you come back to the newsroom from covering an event and you ask your editor, oh, when do you need the story by? And she says, well, I needed it up on the website 15 minutes ago. Uh, then don't waste too much time pondering your lead. Just jot something down, write it, uh, the rest of your story. And, uh, you know, if you have any time, uh, come back and, and work on the lead. So that's going to just about wrap up today's lesson on how to write a good lead. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, the good leads we covered in today's lecture are just a few of the many different types of good ways to begin your stories. Uh, to learn about some of the others, you can visit my website, www.cubreporters.org slash leads. That's www.cubreporters.org slash leads. Uh, and there you'll also find some exercises, some interactive exercises where you can practice your lead writing. And finally, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to email me at mark at cupreporters.org. Once again, I'm Professor Mark Rabowski, and thanks for watching.